we started recording? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. This is the Allah Rahman So I like this slide, so I cut it from last time. Violence and Muslims become beekeepers. And if you remember, I said that beekeeping came between the second and fourth uh, verse, or I hit, between God is the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds, and God is the master of the day of judgment. And also that we have a surah that's named after the bee. But let's move on to tonight's topic, and that is feeding your bees. Why do you feed your bees? Well, we know that there is no creature on earth, but that Allah is its provider. And he knows its place of dwelling and place of storage. All is in a clear register. But he said, I kind of go by a rule that if Allah gives us the means, we have a responsibility. And so we take care of small animals and bees, bees and bees. And if you're going to take any from your bees, you have a responsibility to give them back something in return to make sure that they can make it through the winter so that you can get more honey the next year. You don't want to starve your bees off every year. It's kind of expensive when you starve over every year. So how do we repay them? Well, we need to know what are essential nutrients in honeybee health. They need carbohydrates. This is from the nectar and it provides them with the ability to fly, the energy to fly, uh, to thermoregulate the hive temperature. The, the hive itself is going to be essentially warm blooded, meaning that it will raise its temperature to around 90 degrees, depending on the variety of bee. And they hold it at that temperature so that the brood has a relatively constant temperature for development. And without the honey, well, <laughs> they don't have the food to keep the brood warm. Plus, they need it for winter. You know, the big problem is that plants only bloom for part of the year. And they stop living, and the bees have not collected enough food for the rest of last in the rest of the year. Well, they starve out. The other thing they were need is proteins. The bee body is made out of a good bit of protein, and so to have a lot of bees, you need to have a constant flow of protein into the hive. You have lipids. Basically, all the metabolism has various lipids for its various functions. And then you have vitamins and minerals. And if you go out in the summer, you may find your bees are on the ground and they're just licking the ground in wet spots. And what they're doing is they're trying to pull up salts and minerals out of the soil. Um, if you do a lot of gardening and you have little pots of plants and all, you may find them crawling around in your pots on the, in the soil, pulling the water up, because you tend to water the pots and they tend to stay wet and provide the solution. Okay. So, where do they get the carbohydrates? Basically, nectar. Nectar is a solution composed of one disaccharide, sucrose, and two hexoses, glucose and fructose. Um, depending on the tree or how various amounts of the three con main constituents and that also varies between the plant itself. You know, if you got two trees, they can produce different amounts of the different things. But it's still going to be basically sucrose and the main part and a little bit of glucose and fructose. Now, Bees cannot digest sucrose. Um, the only thing that they can truly digest easily is the glucose and the fructose. And so when you feed your bees sugar water, they cannot actually absorb that. 
that has to go through the processing bees and the processing bees add enzymes in it to break down the sucrose and the glucose and fructose. And so, you know, you have to remember that you need to feed them a little early and give them time for them to process the sugar water that you fed them. So never get them, let them get really low on the sugar. Um, the other thing you should realize is that the nectar they bring back, they can't actually use that as they're coming back. They can't take a sip of what they collected from the flowers. They have to bring it back, provide it to the processor bees, and the processor bees can then convert it into what I call tree honey. Um, it's been processed to a certain extent, and the sucrose has been broken down and it's still very watery. And that's basically where they get their energy for all the different things they do for keeping the hive warm. Proteins mainly come from the pollen. Pollens are uh, somewhere around 32% protein, depending on the plant again. Um, they have a bunch of sugars and some lipids, some vitamin C, and other various things. So, <laughs> aside from the minerals in the water, the bees mainly collect either nectar or pollen. And they have little bags on their sides for collecting their pollen. Let me see, let me see if I can highlight it here. Right there. This, this bee has collected quite a bit of pollen. They have little bags basically on their back legs and they shove it all in those bags. And if you watch your hives, they're flying in. You can see every once in a while when I'm going to come in, this got bags on them <laughs> that are full of pollen, pollen. And those are the ones that are collecting what will become new bees. So you need protein for the new bees and that's mainly from your pollen. They need the nectar they, for the sugar, and they will mix some of that pre-honey or pollen, pack it into the cells in what's known as bee bread. And that's for, also for producing, giving them protein after the dirt starts. Uh, so the dirt is when the plants stop flowering. You get mainly flowering from February to uh, sometime in July, depending on where you're at. And here, at least, we have a little extra time at the end when the golden rod blooms. So, how can you tell if your colony needs help? I tell people that they should leave at least 30 pounds of honey in their hives when they harvest their honey. If they're not going to leave that, then they have to feed heavily so that the bees can then have stores for the summer dirt and the winter. And the University of Georgia recommends that your colony should weigh at least 100 pounds in late fall. Now, if you assume two brood boxes and a super, you can expect around 20 pounds of that would be the wood. And then you need the rest of it to be bees and honey. And that's actually going to be nearly 50 pounds of some form of sugar, protein, bee bread, etc. Um, you can't really expect more than about 30 pounds of bees in a hive. So, you want to go out there and lift it up, or you can go out there and check it and make sure, you know, when you pull up the, the super that it weighs a good bit. Either way, uh, go out there and check and make sure that they have split sufficient supplies to make it through the winter, and you can feed them through the winter as well. So, going back to spring, you should know your nectar sources. Look around, around your property, the area in your neighborhood, and see if you can recognize what is going to feed your bees. Um, and 
February, you have maple trees. But you are also, if you're in the right area, you might get some fruit trees, the pears, plums, apples. Those are usually early blooming. Uh, the problem with that is in February, you may get a late frost and it will kill those flowers off and then they're no good anymore because those fruit trees aren't going to bloom again. Uh, arch dandelions. Uh, people want to go through and kill all the weeds out of the yard, really killing off the bee food as well. April, black locusts. I have not seen many black locusts in my area, um, but it is supposed to be a very good feed. You have clovers, um, various herbs, the flower, typically flower in April. What is it? March winds and May flowers burn in April. Shower, April showers, or well, May flowers. Um, tulip poplar, very useful tree. Um, you may not like the um, honey that comes off of tulip poplar. It's very dark. It's not real sweet, but a tulip poplar is one of the largest nectar producers in this area. Uh, the average tree will produce eight pounds of nectar. It will literally drip off the tree if the tree is doing more well. Um, but you notice then, June, July, sourwood. There may be some other few plants that are blooming, but you have just started severely reducing the amount of nectar available to your bees. If you don't have many sourwoods in your area, you're not in the mountains, your dearth may begin at the end of May. And this is when you need to really start checking your hives, making sure you've still got bees coming in and out for collecting, whether they're bringing in pollen, etc. But by the end of July, in this area at least, you're in what's known as the dirt, the first dirt, the summer dirt. And there may be a few bees coming in in your hive, but the majority of them are probably going to be sitting outside on the front porch, waiting on somebody to come back and say, hey, I got some food, come and get some food. If you remember my last lecture, the reality is that bees tend to have a particular set of plants that they collect from, and if those plants aren't blooming at the time, they sit around. And in June and July, you may see the front of your hive is covered in bees. They're just sitting there. And occasionally, if you keep an eye on it long enough, you will see a bee come in and do a waggle dance on the front of your hive. And it's always interesting, but there is usually going to be a severe reduction. And this is when you really need to make sure that you have enough um, honey left in your hive for the bees to make it through to September or so. September, you get goldenrod. Now, goldenrod is a relatively good nectar plant, but you will not like the honey from it. Most people say it smells like old socks. Now, I've never tasted old socks, so I could not tell you. Um, yes? Well, the concept of the dirt is there's nothing blooming to provide food for it. Your area basically becomes a desert as far as the bees are concerned. There may be a lot of plants around, but they're none more providing any food for bees. Um, we are kind of lucky in this area of Georgia in that while um, most of the plants stop, there are still a few unusual species that produce a little bit of nectar during the middle of summer. And so you may see a small set of flight lines coming out of your hives but it will be significantly less than what you are seeing in the spring. And if they are not bringing back enough food and you had a huge volume of bees developed in the spring, those bees are still eating. 
And so the ones that are bringing back food, they may not be bringing back enough food to maintain the stores. You may actually, your eyes may start getting lighter and lighter in the, in the summer. Um, so, as I say, tulip poplar is one of the largest nectar producer trees that you can find. And the reality is trees tend to produce more nectar than the, the forbs, the clovers, and the other herbaceous plants. So one tulip poplar can produce nearly eight pounds of nectar, which works out to about a gallon of nectar per tree. So if you need 50 pounds of honey in your hives, how many trees would they need to be able to collect everything from? I don't mean collect from, I mean they would have to collect every bit of nectar that that tree produced. And so if we assume your nectar is approximately 5% sugar in the rest of water, that comes out to approximately 0.4 pounds of sugar. We're going to multiply it by 1.2 because it's going to be around 18% water. So that's going to add about 20% to that weight. And you divide that into 50, and you're fine. You need a little over 100 trees that they would have had to collect everything from. Now, assuming a two mile radius of collecting, hopefully you got that. And like I say, this is a tulip poplar, which is the greatest producer of honey that we have in our nectar that we have in this area. So, you really have to hope that of the other trees that they have a bunch of other trees that they can get stuff from as well. Um, the point of all this is that yeah, trees are nice, but you gotta make sure if you're living in you know a farm and all the trees have been cut down and put in fields and so on. Okay, your bees are collecting from maybe blackberries and the rows between the fields and so on. So yes, you need to know what your bees are capable of getting food from and how much they can get based in a uh, two mile radius. Now, there are websites you put in your address and they will draw like a circle of two mile radius around where you say your hives are, and you can look for see what percentage of that area is covered in trees, and assume the rest of it is probably grass or non-productive as far as the bees are concerned. So you can get an idea of how rich the environment is for your area. Now, if you live in a city, it's a kind of a iffy iffy proposition because city folks like to plant flowers, but they may not plant the type of flowers that your bees need, and they may spray those flowers. <laughs> you know, I lost several hives a couple of years ago from uh, someone spraying fruminal, which is a very poisonous compound for bees. It only takes nanograms to kill a bee. So, let's assume we're going to feed our bees, and I recommend doing so. You can feed them sugar syrup, protein substitutes, and in the winter you can feed them fondants or candy, and of course you can always plant some extra flowers, like if you want to buy some clover seed and as you're driving the work for it out the window. <laughs> So you got clover growing on the side of the road. Yeah, do it. Um, Lisa just bought me, I think, five uh, wind, witch hazel trees that were or bushes that we're going to plant. They, seven. Seven? Okay, can't count my mind. Sorry. Um, they, uh, witch hazel tree is kind of a strange tree, it blooms in winter. Days, those blooms were actually survived by frost. And the days that it gets warm enough, the bees will go out and collect from those witch hazel plants. 
So we're planting stuff in the rich side of the plants. Um, They're hard to find. Say again? They're hard to find if people listening already have their bees and they want to find witch hazel for this next this next uh, winter. Next winter. They can plant them now, but I found some through Mike's plants on Etsy. Mike's plants on Mike's, Etsy. And they're good looking plants. That's the ones yes, they, they were good looking plants. The UPS folks did the number to them, but they were good looking plants. Um, we're going to be planting those this weekend, and Mike said they should bloom this year. Yes. Uh, they were about, um, we bought what was supposed to be one foot tall plants, and several of them were much larger, and they actually had seed pods on them, so we know at least some of them are already ready to bloom. <laughs> okay. Got it? So, uh, so what's the average size when they mature? They're, I call them, they say call them trees, but they're really a really big bush. Uh, I think they get maybe 20 feet tall, and they will branch out. You can trim them up to look like a lollipop type tree, uh, but you can also get them where they branch out more like a, uh, a hazelnut. So, sugar water. Sugar water is good any time of the year if you're not going to be collecting honey. You're going to collect honey, don't think you're really sugar water because, you know, it's kind of pretty, it's huh? not really true honey. It's Excuse me, hand the brothers this witch hazel blooms. Okay, you can go, sir. Yeah. Um, I guess, as I was saying, if you're going to collect honey, do not feed your bees sugar because we're just let the other guy see. The, um, you know, you're diluting your honey, basically. It's not going to have plant phytochemicals that the plants are going to produce and put in their nectar. Now, some people do it. Um, China has been known for doing stuff like that. The other main thing you may feed your bees is protein substitute. Um, if your bees are, if your hive is light on bees and you don't have any other way to increase their numbers, like moving a frame in from another hive, you can feed them a protein substitute. Um, as I said, a protein is for producing more bees. And while there has been some minor amount of research on what bees need for protein, there isn't a lot. Now, again, the various pollens and various trees have, you know, their own makeup of protein. So hopefully the bees are relatively good with, you know, accepting a variety of proteins. Most of the protein sub substitutes are going to be come, out, come out of soybeans. Um, so it's just that. <laughs> now, as I said, you can feed a pollen patty. It's called a pollen patty, but it doesn't actually have pollen in it. Um, in the spring, if you want to build your numbers up before the nectar flow starts, or if at the end of the nectar flow you have a new hive and it still hasn't really built itself up yet, feed it pollen and sugar so that you've artificially extended the time in which they can improve the, size, the volume of their uh, hive. Um, fondant and candy bars. Fondant, it's like um, cake ice. Um, used mainly for the Norfolk here. Um, and candy bars literally is sugar candy. You make your own sugar candy just for your bees. And put them in a little feeder and there you go. They're kind of walk up there and start eating it. Um, and then again, the natural foliage enhancement. So let's go. 
Common sugar syrup concentrations, two to one. I kind of messed up on that one. Five to three, three to two, and one to one. No. As I said, nectar is typically approximately 5% sugar. So all of these concentrations are much higher than they expect to find in the plants themselves, which is fine because they're going to put it in that hive and dehydrate it to it's only about 18% water, which is going to be you know, much drier, or use the term drier, than the two to one. So in the winter or late fall, if your hive is light, feed them two to one. In the spring or the summer, if you've got a new hive that you're trying to boost the size of, feed it one to one. And I don't ever feed three to two or two to three to two or five to three. You can if you want. Um, the bees don't care too much. You would use one to one in the summer because it has an extra water in there and um, they kind of need the water. They will go out and collect water, especially if your neighbor has a swimming pool. You may get people complaining, hey, your bees are in my swimming pool. Well, there's not much you can do about that, so give them another source of water. But nonetheless, uh, don't, don't freak out about making these sugar concentrations exact. As I say, they start off with 5% sugar water and they concentrate it down to 18% water and sugar. So anywhere in between there, they're fine with it. Okay? You also, if you go online and you get into some bee discussion groups, you're fine folks that are very adamant that you should not ever borrow the sugar of water. Um, the concept being that you burn, you burn the sugar and it produces chemicals that can make your bees sick. Now, I'm going to tell you to ignore that, and I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Um, the reality is you put water on your stove, you heat it up at 212 degrees, it starts boiling. And it will not get any hotter than, than that <laughs> until you've got the sugar concentration to the point that there's, you know, the, the sugar interferes with the boiling. And if you've ever made candy or stuff like that, you've got a candy thermometer, you put it in there, and as the water boils out, it gets hotter and hotter. But it won't actually become fudge, burnt sugar, until it gets almost no water. So if you're going to make hard candy or fondant, you're already going to bring it up to a higher temperature than the water's going to boil at when you try to just make simple sugar syrup. So I tell folks, ignore that. <laughs> you know, um, just stir. You know, I, what I do is I bring the water to a boil, and then I put the sugar in it, and then I just start stirring. Now, I may turn the heat off, or I may just leave it on for a little bit, but you just stir, and stir, and stir. And eventually, the water will turn clear. And at that point, you can stop stirring. Turn the heat off and let it cool down. Once it's cool, you can add amendments. Now, you can add amendments when it's still hot, but since most of the amendments are going to be uh, essential oils, all you're going to do is evaporate more of those out than you really want to, so let it cool and then add your amendments. Um, and as I say, the door. So the amendments, are they needed or just, uh, just giving you flavor? I'll go over that. <laughs> but both. A little bit of flavor, a little bit of other stuff. For instance, if you have wintergreen oil in the amendment, the wintergreen oil will help protect your hive a little bit from um, certain mites. Uh, thymol, which is a common thing, helps with tracheal mites, and a little bit with the varroa mites. But um, yeah, you can add your amendments. Feeders, will you, 
Oh, I moved it over here. All right. This is a common fear. Cost. I can't read it anymore. It doesn't cost much. Um, basically, you put your sugar water in the container. Put the top on. You walk out to your hive. When you get to the hive, you flip it over, and the fluid, the sugar water, start coming out here. You slide that into the the opening of your hive. There. Oh, yep, he got one. All sorts of different versions. This one. Um, this one. I'm going to take this off. There's a little hose in the lid, and the bees will crawl up underneath there and kind of look up and, and start licking the stuff. Um, this one has a metal lid that they just drill a few holes in. Um, and someone has decided, hey, I'm going to make that out of plastic. And the reality is it won't rust on you. But they're a little more expensive to ones with plastic. These, oh, over there. Yeah, just that back in. These are good for winter. Do not use them in spring or summer. Probably not even in the fall. You don't want to use them when the bees can come out of the hive. Um, the reason being, if you have multiple hives, what you're inviting is the bees from one hive to come to another hive, start taking the sugar water, and at some point, instead of just taking it from the feeder, they're going to go into that hive and start robbing the hive. You know, take this back. So I recommend only using the in entrance feeders in winter. And on the days where it's cold, below 53 degrees, because the bees don't want to come out. If they don't come outside, they won't go to another hive and start robbing. Now, you can use these in the summer, but don't put them in the entrance. Go a long way away and sit them on a stone or something. The bees will find them, and that way they'll say, oh, there's food over here, and they're not thinking about going into a different hive to rob it. All right? Um, ants, yes, you can get ants. A lot of ants. Here is another format feeder. This is what I've been using this summer. Um, you look know, closely, there are little holes right there, just in this area. I'm going to hand this to you. Take a sniff. Just take it around and let people smell it. I take those at least 100 feet, preferably 2 to 300 feet away from the hive. You turn it upside down, put a couple of boards underneath it so that they can crawl under there. It doesn't have, you know, that one is already designed where they can crawl in there. This thing, it sits flat. Now, this thing is fine for a distance like that. The other thing you can do is you take an extra brood box, put it on the top of your hive, leave the inner cover underneath that box, turn the sucker upside down, over the hole in the inner cover. That's why there's only a little spot there for the, the fluid to come out. Take a good sniff of that. Um, some hole here? Yes, in the little less thing in the middle. At the hand or the left? No, I just turn it upside down. Now it's still got some fluid in it because it, it won't ever all drain to the bottom. Because I have uh, too much ants in my backyard. Yes. Okay, if you have ants, I would recommend... Uh, millions. <laughs> yeah, I would recommend getting predator nematodes. It's a nematode that crawls into the body of the ant. It starts eating the ant, laying eggs. The eggs hatch. You eat more nematodes, they crawl out, go into another ant. It's a biological control, and it will last for a year or two. Where do you find it? 
go online, search for predator nematodes, and make sure you get the predator nematode that's for ants. You can spray it in the spring. It will take two or three weeks to kill a hive, depending on how kill a mound, depending on how much you put in the mound. Because, like I say, they crawl in the, into the ants, they lay eggs, and so you got like a biological cycle that eventually will wipe out that that mound. But it will take a few, take a little while. Uh, however, those ants are coming back. For about a year and a half, those nematodes can last about food for about a year and a half. So, two years later, you're probably going to start seeing some more ants, buy some more fruit, and nematodes, and spray them. Um, as I say, you can put this one inside your hive, turn it upside down over the inner cover for the. Uh, this one will take a deep. To, to, you know, it's a little shallower than a deep, and then you put your outer cover on top of that. This is the standard in hive um, feeder. It looks kind of like a frame. You take a couple of frames out. This is especially good for uh, a hive that you are just starting because you can fill this up. You put it in the thing. You put the frames that you want them to build off of right beside it. And all they have to do is kind of walk over there and get some food. You can then feed them a lot of sugar water and give them the, the carbohydrates that they need to produce wax because it takes eight pounds of honey to produce one pound of wax. You need to, when the hive is first starting out, you need to give them a lot of sugar. Okay? Now, you may not be able to see it, but I'm going to pass this around anyway. There's a little blockage thing right here. It's called a ladder. And it allows the bees to crawl down, get to this stuff, crawl back up instead of just falling into the sugar water and drowning. So when you buy one of these, make sure you get the ladders. Make sure you put the ladders in. <laughs> okay? Now, the one problem with these is you've got to take your hive apart to put more food in. So it's good, as I say, for a hive that's just starting out, because it's going to be relatively warm weather at that point anyway, and you want to go into your hive pretty often anyway. So every time you go into your hive, refill it. All right, there you go. Um, not as good in the winter, because you do have to take your hive apart to put food in there. Uh, but if you're Winter temperatures are, you know, above 50. Thank you. You won't be chilling your brood that much anyway. So if you're in an area where your temperatures are consistently above 50, you can take your hive apart and, and use something like this. If your temperatures are below 50 consistently, use the in entrance feeder. Okay? Because you can replace the in entrance feeder or refill it without any trouble. Now, another problem with this thing is it takes up the space of two frames, but it's not quite that wide, okay? So when you put it in there, put it up against the wall, if, if you want to push the other frames over and leave the gap on the other side of the hive. If you don't do that, what's going to end up happening is they're going to start building wax on the feeder or the, they're, you know, they're going to fill that gap in. So this thing's not quite as wide as two frames, and so puts everything to the side. And then, we have the large-scale and high feeder. This one, this is supposed to float on top of the sugar water so that your bees don't crack. The problem is, if you get enough bees on this, it'll start sinking. <laughs> um, 
But this thing will hold two gallons, a gallon on each side. So this is a fill it up and forget about it for a while. Oh, okay. Here you go. Can you see it? There you go. That will say, now, the bees can crawl up in this area here, crawl over and down. You can see other end high feeders like this, and they may have a ladder system in there where they crawl up in the middle, they crawl over, and there's just a small area that they can enter. This one, they get off this full area that they can enter. Eh, I kind of like it. Uh, don't use it that much. It's hard to clean, you see it's all wood. Um, but, um, again, if you are in an area where it doesn't get real cold in the winter, since there's only a small area here, you don't, you're not tearing your hive totally down to expose the tops of the frames. You can take the cover off and fill this and you've only exposed a little bit, maybe one frame. And it doesn't take long to refill the sucker and put the lid back on. So it was pretty good about that. All right. Now, again, if you are going to feed your bees in the summer during the dirt, do not feed them on the hive. Now, you can feed them in the hive because then you know, the other bees don't necessarily smell anything new. Now, if you sniff that, you notice that there was a scent in the, that sewer water that I created. And that scent can get out of that hive. So you might actually attract bees into the hive if you put enough into a feeder like this. So typically, if you are going to feed with an end hive feeder in the summer, use an entrance reducer. So they can guard their entrance better. Uh, you might want to put it on the wide area if you got a lot of bees coming in and out, but you probably do want to use an entrance reducer. So let's look at the very steep. Where's my cursor? Fondant. As I say, fondant is cake icing, basically. Four parts sugar, one part water. A quarter teaspoon of vinegar for every pound of sugar. Um, going to add a little acid to it if you're going to reduce the, the you know, the disease organisms that are grow and, and start eating the fun. Um, you are going to mix a lot of air into the fun at, at the last stage. So you heat it all up, you put the the sugar in there, you put the water in there. There's not much water in that, so it may not easily dissolve initially. So you can add water to it till it does dissolve, but the more water you add, the longer it's going to take to boil it back out. You will heat this until it reaches, well, this is 190 degrees, oh, 235 degrees Fahrenheit, which is uh, higher than 212, but still not hard crack state. So this is going to end up kind of like taffy, and you're going to mix air into it, and then you pour it in paper plates. And when you go to feed your bees, you take, just take the paper plate, turn it upside down on the, on the tops of the hive. Um, never done it. Never used fondant. It's more of a farther north thing. You store it in the freezer, you know, not bad. Yes? Do you consider making a how-to video later this month? <sighs> yeah, we could. So keep an eye, well, was, keep an eye on the Muslim Beekeeping Initiative YouTube <laughs> channel. Yeah, we <laughs> may have to make it a couple of times and then film it. <laughs> Bee candy. Well, um, the fondant's fine for the cooler areas. The candy, if it gets really cold, just put some candy in there. Now, there are folks that actually, you know, wait for Easter to be over and buy the, uh, um, uh, little mints, hard mints with the red coloring in it and all that stuff, and save that for feeding the bees after they take all the honey off. Eh? 
This one, 10 pounds of sugar, one quart of water. That's not much water for 10 pounds of sugar. Uh, tablespoon lemon juice, tablespoon of white vinegar, and later, a teaspoon of honeybee healthy. Uh, bring it all to our water. You bring this up to 250 degrees Fahrenheit. You notice that's a little hotter than the other one, the fondant is 135. This is your, what candy makers would call a hard crack state. It's going to end up being hard, like regular sugar candy. And you won't mix any air into it. Um, again, you pour it into a mold, and when you're ready to feed it, you just turn it upside down over the, uh, the frames. Now, in both of these cases, what you've done is you've lifted, you've created an air gap above your frames, and you might want to use something like a shallow above this, you know, surround your, your bee candy or fondant with shallow. The other thing is in places where they use this farther north, they typically also put a blanket into their hive. Blanket is not so much for insulation as it is to absorb moisture. Because in really cold areas, when bees breathe out and they release a bunch of humidity, that rises because they're keeping it warm, hits the top of your hive and will condense. And then it starts dripping that back down in the hive. It drips on the fondant and starts dissolving the fondant. And all that stuff starts leaking back down into your hive. The next thing you know, you've got bees that are just crystallized. <laughs> so you don't want that. Uh, as I say, farther north, they will put the blanket. Sometimes it's a bag filled with um, wood shavings. Just something to absorb moisture. All right. So we've got fondant, we've got bee candy. Pollen patty. All pollen patties, but they do not have any pollen in them. You never feed pollen back to your bees, typically. You, know, you don't go out and buy pollen from Amazon to feed your bees. You just, you know, you can spread diseases into your hot flower, so they say don't do it. Now, this is an old mix, old set of ingredients, soy flour, birds, yeast. Fat fruit, dry milk, milk flour, powder. Didn't really believe these could digest milk. Um, and vitamin C tablets. Uh, mix it all up. Add some one to one sugar syrup, syrup to it. It's right here. And depending on how much um, volume. layers of wax paper. This is going to be a goo, typically. So, get your piece of wax paper, put the stuff on there, get another piece of wax paper, kind of flatten it out. And then you, after you've made a bunch of these, you just stack them up together and stick them in a freezer. And then when you, if you go to use them, you take one out and defrost it. You can buy a commercial version of this where they've already mixed it all up and they put it between wax paper. Very gooey. I've used that. It's kind of expensive. It's about $30 for 10 pounds of pollen patties. But 10 pounds of pollen patties will last you for a very long time. Um, typically, you would use maybe one in the spring unless you were really trying to build your numbers up really good, or in which case you might use two. The problem with these are is that when the pollen, the real pollen starts being available, the bees will abandon these. The, you know, they're just stopping eating. It's like the fur pollen over soybeans, evidently. 
Yeah. Can't boil them. Um, and then you got this gooey thing inside your um, hide that is great food for other things. And if you put one of these in here in your hive and you've got small hive beetles, you have just created a problem. Because those small hive beetles will lay eggs in that pollen heavy, and the next thing you know, it's full of the maggots from the, from the small hive beetles. So if you want to put these into your hive, make sure you've done a good job of getting rid of small hive beetles. Keep an eye on it. If the bees start abandoning it, you know, if the bees decide they're not going to eat it, take it out. Because pollen petties are one of the major creators of small hive beetles. <laughs> but if you've got a hive that has small set of numbers, Feed them a pollen patty. That's, that gets them the protein from creating them, increasing their numbers. You just got to make sure that they will eat it. Now, when you get it out of the freezer, it's got wax paper on both sides. Go for it. Now, take a knife, score that wax paper. Just, you know, so you have a knife cuts through the wax paper, and the bees can go up there. The bees are going to treat this initially as a foreign body in their hive and they're going to try to get rid of it. But then they're going to taste it and go, oh, this is food. <laughs> okay. So you cut those slices in there and that's where the bees will initially start eating. And they will work their way out. So run all your cuts in the same direction and when you put it in your hive, put those cuts perpendicular to the frames so that at every frame opening there are several of those cuts that they can then eat from. Um, again, as I say, you can look and you can find newer recipes for these or you can make your own from a mix that you can buy. And we'll go over that part right like now. Bee Pro, there's actually several thing, protein powders, protein shakes, if you want to call it, for your bees that you can get. Bee Pro is a very common one. Now, I want to point out here that it's $19 for one pound. Twice, for twice that, you can get 10 pounds. <laughs> and if you have a lot of bees, you can come up with nearly two thousand dollars and buy fifteen hundred pounds. The funny thing about this, if you buy that one pound thing and you read the label on the back, that gives you instructions for the fifteen hundred pounds <laughs> mixing it up, which is kind of weird, you know. But I recommend buying it in ten pounds. And if you look closely, uh, it says free of all contaminants, contains no natural pollen. Well, they're going to tell you, don't feed pollen back to your bees unless you collected it from that hive. Um, kind of expensive, you know, 40 bucks for 10 pounds, but 10 pounds will last you a very long time. Um, if you assume your pollen patty is going to be about half a pound to put into your hive, you know, that's 20 pollen patties dry away. If you're going to mix sugar water into there, so it's a gooey, and that's going to increase it. So you're going to get maybe 25, 30 pollen patties out of a 10 pound uh, container. Oh, excuse me. If it's a half pound each, 10 pounds, 20, yeah, 25, about 25 pollen patties. And that's cheaper than buying pollen patties already mixed up because they have all the shipping and the packaging and all that stuff. So you can mix this, and as I say on the back, it has instructions on how much sugar water to add to it. Um, again, don't get real picky with it, but these aren't going to care. Uh, just make sure it's gooey enough for them to eat it, but not so liquid that it's going to flow. You want it to be uh, a good <laughs> And let's see, last slide, this is short. 
the essential oils, the supplement for your sugar water that you have smelled. It's expensive. This is $31 for one pound. A little bitty bottle. But it goes a long way. This one we're making. This is enough to, for 24 gallons of sugar solution. So, yeah. you know, it comes out to a little less than a dollar a gallon for your sugar solution to create. And that's assuming you can use the concentration they recommend. You can reduce that a little bit. And in fact, on the back, I should have taken a picture of the back. Um, instead of using smoke, some people will mix this stuff really light in water and just use a spray bottle with this thing. Yeah. I haven't tried that. I tend not to use smoke unless I'm, you know, I'm collecting the honey or something like that because then I'm going to be in the hive a while. Um, all right, so do not eat the honey from the sugar syrup, especially if you put this stuff in there. It's got a good bit of thymol. You all smell that thymol, right? That honey is going to be bitter. You try to you feed this to your bees and then collect honey from it. You smell it and you taste it. Fine plants is not all that great with honey. <laughs> Especially concentrated fine flavor. Um, some people were actually put cake coloring in their sugar water when they feed their bees. And that way they can tell the frames that have been created from the sugar water. Now, a lot of folks are use a blue cake coloring because there aren't any real blue honeys. There is a purple honey, <laughs> and you may get some purple honey in your hives right now. If your bees cannot find anything else to eat, they may find, uh, what's the? Kudzu. Kudzu produces a purple honey, which is supposed to taste like grape jelly, but the bees do not like it, so it's kind of rare. The kudzu is really blooming right now, but it blooms during the dirt. But unless your bees are really desperate, they're not going to go to it. Still, you get some purple honey in your hive, people, people find it interesting. So, any questions? Any more questions? So, you got a hive that's weak, and you don't have any way of adding frame in, you know, from, from some other hive. Some brood in it, start feeding it on head. Keep an eye on it. This is a this is the time of year when those small hot beetles just multiply. Um, again, if you've taken up a lot of sugar out of your hive, um, a lot of honey out of your hive, feed during the dirt, feed the sugar solution during the dirt. And you probably have a huge number of bees at the beginning of the dirt. They're going to live for about a month and a half, and they're going to eat that whole time. So they can go through a bunch of your honey. Uh, you feed them sugar water. You're, you know, hold their own. Hopefully when fall comes around and the um, golden rods blooming, they can build back up. At the end of the year, the way you're high, kind of pick it up and make sure it feels heavy enough that they can make it through the winter. Maybe every two weeks during the winter, put a, uh, a little feeder of sugar water on the front of it, just to, just to make sure they have something. And you may not want to go into your hive during the winter, but you can still uh, pick it up a little bit, maybe a little gap. They really glued it all together, and they tend to really glue your hive together in the fall because they're trying to keep out the drought. Uh, that thing may just come up as one piece. <laughs> you may pick, try to pick up that super and you just pick up the whole hive. Just be careful you set it back down easily. At least on my, my stands, because my stands are empty in the You may not have noticed, but we've got goldenrod blooming in full bloom right in front of our bird feeders. Oh, we've got so goldenrod blooming already? Yeah, it started. Uh, there you go. Um, Golden rod were bloom nearly to the first frost. Till October, November. Yeah. 
So, at least here, your bees have a good second chance. You know? Now, leave that honey for them. It's supposed to taste pretty bad. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Any other comments? So, I think I was, because uh, we don't have that many folks, so they can just personally interact with me. Yeah, we're going to post this on some site somewhere and if they want to get the information or if you want to go back and review, you can pause it at some point and write down the formulas or something. Are you in the group? Okay. So uh, I think you added after the video was posted, the first video. I'm going to post it again here so you can uh, it's, it's because right now we wanted to talk about uh, what is required to do for this part of the year. Uh, but we can always go back and discuss. Uh, you, you, if, you, if you want to discuss um, basic stuff, it's best time. So I guess you need yeah, to uh, you can talk to the lecture. How old is the children? Oh, you can give it to yeah. So I'm from the no, I'm keeping most of mine. I only had one hive survive last year's drought and the cold spell beginning of this year. And I've been rebuilding some of the terminology. So I only got uh, 40 pounds of honey this year. So I'm you take four mine. practices a year, okay. and you come out I every two weeks and help them with the bees. Yes. Okay. So by spring time, I'll tell you the, decide tell the girls you want to do this. I can't take any direct you know part. <laughs> which month to do, every month you do different things for the bees. Mm -hmm. And then in the spring, if we have bees, we do is splits. Is that Sister Shamin? And you can buy a hive. Yeah. Oh, it's not going to So yeah. she also missed the first class. Yeah. And we have uh, another brother who is the first class. If they want to discuss basic stuff, you know, the basic. Testing, uh... testing. How are you doing? Can you speak a little more on that? Hmm? What? I still have a second.